for now, but uh, of course, folks who continue to log in, we'll be uh, welcoming them as they come. Uh, well, good evening, all, and uh, welcome to tonight's Kitchen Table Talk. This is a conversation hosted by Redeemer Presbyterian Church uh, on the Upper West Side in New York City. Uh, my name is Joel Cady, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. A very warm welcome to you all, and I'm so honored to have you all here. Uh, this series of Kitchen Table Talks is an idea conceived by Steve Prince, who's here with us. He's an artist and board member of SIVA, which is the uh, Christians in Visual Arts, uh, which has partnered with Steve to make space for these conversations. And uh, Steve's the moderator of these times, and I'll introduce him in more detail in just a moment. Let me just say briefly that as a minister, the, uh, the setting and the symbol of the table is an extraordinary one. Uh, maybe the central one in the Christian faith. Uh, the sweeping biblical story, you know, begins at a fateful meal in Eden, and it ends at a worldwide feast with none other than God at the table. Uh, meanwhile, you might say that the church itself finds its genesis at a meal, the Last Supper, and the table was maybe the primary context for the church's earliest centuries of gatherings. Uh, Jesus spoke often at table, eating with people of all backgrounds and even drawing scandal upon himself for doing so. His central message is, in the metaphor of feasts, that, quote, there is still room. I love that. There is still room, he would say. Uh, so the kitchen table has, of course, uh, for all cultures, been a place where important and honest conversations can happen with love, with laughter, with listening, learning. So my hope is that this time inspires each of you uh, listening in to set the table yourselves with your neighbors. Have conversations like these uh, with, with those around you. So the power of the table, it's, it's really amazing. Um, well, our friend Steve Prince has set a table for us in the form of the conversation that's about to take place. We're gonna hear tough issues talked about that are facing us as a society and even how Christians might respond in unique ways. Uh, our panelists, Jeremy Del Rio, Chelsea Horvath and Eva Ting are community leaders with insight into our subject matter, which for tonight is the question that was once asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor? We'll introduce our panelists in a few moments. For now, though, let me introduce our moderator, Steve Prince, to you all now. Uh, Steve is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, and he currently resides in Williamsburg, Virginia. He's the director of engagement and distinguished artist in residence at the Muscarel Museum at William and Mary. Steve received his BFA from Xavier University of Louisiana and his MFA in printmaking and sculpture from Michigan State University. He's a mixed media artist, master printmaker, lecturer, educator, and art evangelist. He's taught middle school, high school, community college, four-year public and private schools, and has conducted workshops internationally in all kinds of media. Steve's also worked with several churches over the years uh, from various denominational backgrounds across the nation, spreading a message of hope and renewal. Uh, philosophically rooted in the cathartic nature of the jazz funerary tradition of New Orleans. Uh, to Steve, art media is like languages to a linguist as he integrates multiple artistic media and practices while working with virtually every age bracket and multiple ethnicities. Steve's the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including this year, a Virginia Museum of Fine Arts grant. He's shown his work internationally in various solo group and juried exhibitions. And he's also represented by galleries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and in Georgia, in the cities of Columbus and Atlanta. He's participated in several residencies, including artists in residence at Segura Arts Center at Notre Dame, Pyramid Atlantic Art Center in Hyattsville, Maryland, the Atlanta Printmaker Studio, and the University of Iowa, just to name a few. And he's also showing at the gallery house in our church's building, the W83 Ministry Center, uh, virtually for now. It's an exhibit called Communal Resurrection, and you must must watch the artist talk he gave us a couple of weeks back, which is up on the exhibit website. It was incredible. Uh, so Steve, a huge thank you, and uh, I'm going to let you take it from here. Um, thank you so much, Joel. Um, again, one thing that I say whenever I, I have the opportunity to speak to people is I say it is both a privilege and an honor to be able to come and to share and to talk and to share the good news together as uh, one body. Um, I first like to give honor to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to each and every one of us that's covered under his blood. 
Um, before I go into um, the introduction of our panelists, um, we want to make sure that we do some things that is proper for the house. Uh, one thing I want to do is, is share with you um, a scripture. Um, I'm coming from Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. And then following that sharing of that um, scripture, I'm going to open this up with a prayer of consecration uh, for this event. And then I'm going to move into and begin to give us an outline of how things are going to flow this evening and talk to you a little bit more in depthly about the idea of the kitchen table. Luke 10, 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, and I say, when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, first and foremost, I want to give you thanks and all the glory unto your wonderful and matchless name. Oh God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this gathering of your souls into this space to speak through this medium that has been created called Zoom. Oh God, I know that many of us are tired and are weary of speaking through this manner and desire to be in community with each and every one in the ways in which we have cultivated in the past. But oh God, you are continuing to let us know that we are forever in the midst of a new season. So God, I just, I thank you for that you have still preserved the life within this world and given us an opportunity to continue to give you all the praises and all the glory to you, oh God. But you continually give us an opportunity in which we can share and speak about this experience and speak about this journey. And oh God, you've given us the opportunity to say we're sorry for our trespasses, to ask for forgiveness for, for when we fall short, to give us the opportunity to say that we love each other, oh God, and that we love the God within each and, every, each and every one of us. We love the blood that flows through our veins. We love the ways and things that people have created out of their hearts that have been inspired by you, oh God. Lord, we are thankful this day. 
So Lord, I pray this prayer of consecration over this event. I pray that all the ears and all the minds that are out there all across this land, wherever they may be in whatever situation they may be in, I pray that they are able to receive like a sweet melody, like a balm from Gilead, some healing in these words and know that the community is here and is wanting and waiting and wanting to be in community to make a true transformation in this world away from the things that we see before us on televisions and in communities, on porches and barrios and low places and high places. Oh God, we see it all, but give us a divine vision of each other. Give us a divine knowing and understanding that we can use this opportunity, this medium to continue to speak to one another to continue to care for one another. Oh God, consecrate our words, consecrate this union, but have it grow and multiply like a beautiful vine that grows and meanders upon the wall. But Lord, give it strength and give it resilience. Give us that strength and resilience that be able to withstand the storm that is raging all around us. Oh God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us your gifts, oh God continue to dispel them upon us and give us wisdom to understand and to discern. I thank you, O oh God. In these precious words, we pray unto you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, it is, again, I will repeat my words as both a privilege and an honor to come and share before you this evening and to have another opportunity to have a kitchen table talk together. This is an important uh, thing in terms of home structures to have this opportunity to not only break bread together, but to share the stories of the everyday and to continue to edify each other at this table, but also challenge each other. I think that's critical um, in terms of the interaction. We can't be complacent um, in our spaces um, and, 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 and know what we think we know. That's so important for us to stretch. So I'm just thankful for this opportunity to come. So I want to take this time right now to introduce our panelists. And I'm gonna read some biographical information by each one. And then right after I read the, the biographical information and introduce our panelists to you, um, give you a little lay of the land in terms of how things are going to flow. Um, the schedule is going to be that we're going to first start off with just some Q&A that I have prepared some, some questions for the panelists to engage. And we're not just simply like, Chelsea, you, you answer this. Jeremy, you answer this. Eva, you answer this. No, let's just be fluid and let the spirit guide this table. So if there is a question that Chelsea has, or that Jeremy has as a follow-up, or Eva has as a follow-up. Let's not keep me positioned as like, oh, Steve is the leader, we wait for him to speak and to guide us. No, I'm, I'm like, think of me like a catalyst. I kind of got it started. And then once that ball start rolling, let us, let us flow with that. Now, we also gotta be conscious of time because we can't be on here all night, but sometimes it gets that good and you wanna be on here all night. You know how it is, you know how it gets in church sometimes. And so it, it, it's, it's okay, all right? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna make sure we be conscious of the time and keep things moving. After we go through a round, a round robin of questions between us in a conversation, we're gonna open up the questions that we have uh, from the audience that wanna to come to the table and have us be in the field as well. And then at the end of that, the last thing I'd like to engage us in, in terms of this interaction is to begin to speak about what are we doing? What are the things that we're doing right now within our communities? What are the things do we need help with that we want to use this opportunity as a platform to propel to everybody say, hey, we need some assistance in this particular thing. And then, um, and then of course, what are some of the charges, the, the spaces that we need to work on? And that's what we're going to leave it off with. We're going to leave with a definite a strong positive of what are we doing? Okay, some elements of this conversation may sound like we're fussing or we're pouting or we're just upset or just angry. That's all good because that's part of emotions. That's part of what a family does. The conversations and the things that we're gonna talk about are not easy things. And the work that we must do is not easy work. It's hard, consistent, persistent, laborsome work that we must do, okay? So I want to make sure I set that. We got to set the tone right with the tables like right here, okay? 
So I want the panelists to know where we at and how we situated and how we're going to flow with it. Okay. So with that being said, let me uh, let me uh, introduce our esteemed panelists um, that are going to be speaking before you. So I first we introduce Jeremy Del Rio, who are Thrive Collective. Jeremy Del Rio. Um, Esquire as co-founder and leads the Thrive Collective, a nonprofit that creates hope and opportunity through arts and mentoring in and around public schools. He also teaches youth and community development at Alliance and Fuller Seminaries and connects, trains, and mentors youth workers nationally. He has consulted businesses and nonprofits, nonprofits on leadership and strategy since 2000 and co-founded and directed Generation Excel a holistic youth center in Manhattan from 1996 to 2006. Jeremy was the founding youth pastor at Abounding Grace Ministries in 1994 to 2004 and also worked as a corporate attorney in New York before resigning after 9-11 to lead relief work at Ground Zero. He has contributed to six books and his articles have appeared in dozens of publications. His two sons are proud New York City public school students and graduates. Let us welcome Brother Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Indeed, indeed. Our next Pamela is uh, Chelsea Horvath, All Angels Church. Chelsea Horvath has served as the Director of Community Ministries at All Angels Church since 2015. A licensed social worker and lay minister, she, she oversees the programs and initiates um, uh, of the and initiatives of the church that foster the compassionate care, life transform transformation, and spiritual formation of individuals who struggle with homelessness, addiction, and mental health challenges. In a role as director, she has built up the church's social services program that addresses the health, mental health, and hygiene of our city's homeless neighbors in collaboration with a team of colleagues with lived experience. In addition to overseeing programs, Chelsea facilitates the integration of our homeless neighbors into the full life of the church and its worshiping community. Prior to her work at All Angels, Chelsea worked in Shanghai, China with a faith-based organization dedicated to the city's arts and culture sector, its impact on local communities and the discipleship of artists. Chelsea has an MSW in organizational management and leadership from Hunter College and a BS in art education from Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Institute of Art. Let us welcome Chelsea. Indeed. And last but definitely not least, um, we have Eva Ting with W83 Ministry Center. Eva Ting is the Director of Events and Programming at W83 Ministry Center, the home of Redeemer Presbyterian West Side Church that also serves as a community and cultural center on the Upper West Side of New York City. Our interests lie in cultivating spaces for community engagement and designing arts and programming that invite the public to participate in thoughtful conversations as well as thoughtful action. Prior to her work at W83, Eva was the public programs coordinator at Times Square Alliance, executing public art installations and events in one of the world's most iconic urban places. Eva lived in Shanghai, China for several years and directed two cities, a gallery that specialized in contemporary craft and hosted music and cultural events, including a well-loved jazz performance series. Eva holds a BA in English and a BS in journalism from Boston University and an MA in visual arts administration from New York University. And I also know Eva through an organization which was mentioned in my in relation to my name called SIVA, which stands for Christians in the Visual Arts. And that's where I passed first cross. And so let us give a warm welcome to Eva. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Oh, it's, it's a, this, is a, this is what is called, as some people would call a fire panel. This is number fire right here. 
<laughs> so just really thankful to be able to serve with you all um, in this moment and, um, and to share and so forth. Um, I wanted to, before we move in to our conversation, I wanted to share with you an art piece. And I asked if Eva could uh, share it to the screen um, for us. The name of this piece is I created it um, probably about seven years ago. And I made it for a conference that took place in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the name of the conference was called Who Is My Neighbor? And that whole conference was an interfaith conference that was gathering together people to grapple with that very question. And so I wanted to create some kind of piece that commemorated it. And then when I got there, the beautiful thing I found out that it became the backdrop for the conference. Um, the piece is nine feet by 14 feet in scale. It is an historical image that I recreated, but I actually put a little twist to it. The image is of the 1963 March on Washington, where people from all across the nation gathered together in Washington, D.C. in a fight for equality, in a fight for social justice, a fight for seeing us as one harmonious body. This image is actually at the very end of the March on Washington and the people were singing. They were singing together a sweet song that was flowing from their lips. And if you look at the woman, the second woman on the left and the woman on the right, the second in from the right, you can see their mouths are in the posture of singing. And they, their arms are overlapping each other and they were singing, we shall overcome. And I thought about the piece and the ways in which their arms overlapped. It was as if they were making a chain link between their bodies. The original image, they were in front of the Lincoln Memorial, the columns back behind it. And in a blurry shot, you saw the Lincoln statue sitting in his chair. I was going to draw that in, but I made a last minute decision not to put that into the image. And I removed it. And in its place, as you look at the background of the composition, you will note there are male and female bodies almost lined up like the DNA strands. But I was also making an allusion to the institution of slavery, an institution that so much of this nation was built upon an institution of slavery that has affected our nation and we're still living out the reverberation of those acts from that past that is still affecting us to this day. So those people created links between their bodies, not in the form of chains, but in the form of connection. They chose to be there. They chose to hold hands. They chose to sing. They chose to stand together with a single mind. And one unfortunate thing about this piece is that as I talk to you about this very celebratory element about what was happening one month later in that same year, a bomb went off at 16th Street Baptist Church. And four little girls who were in the basement just coming out of the bathroom, putting on lip gloss. They died that day, one month after this event. One thing that's not talked about in the midst of that deep sorrow is that there was one girl, one extra girl, a fifth child in that bombing who survived. She lost one of her, the sight in one of her eyes and the hearing in one of her ears because of the blast. Took her years to get her balance back, meaning being able to go to school and to function properly within that setting. You see, in that time period, and I'm thinking about all the degrees that are on this panel, they didn't have counseling groups that came to her home and she didn't get pulled out of school and they didn't have people work with her and give her the help that she needed. Uh, the girl was thrust back into the classroom and she had to sift through it the best way she could. She had to survive with all of that survivor's remorse and all of the issue of being the one that comes out of the rubble and she has to live. The girl goes from an A student to an F student and then she 
had a series of issues throughout her life to her grappling with these, these problems. But she didn't give up and people around her didn't give up. They continued to pray for her. They continued to support her. They continued to lift her up. I'm sure she was thrown on the back of many donkeys and brought to many inns and served much food to get her back in alignment. This woman now is still alive. Her name is Sarah Collins. Sarah Collins is an evangelist now. She does not spread a word or a message of hate. She spreads a message of love wherever she goes. I had the fortune of meeting her about three years ago, sat with her and heard her story. And I'm sharing it with you tonight to give you a little bit of a context of the past because that's so important as we talk about now. So let us go back to the panel and let us begin to have a conversation at the table. First and foremost that I need to do, panelists, um, um, actually I'm, I'm switch from using the word panelists, this brothers and sisters. Um, the, first, the first line of order is how are you doing in this moment? And when I say in this moment, I'm, I'm talking, of course, I'm talking about this pandemic that has got the entire world turned on, on its head. And that's, that's a light way of putting it. Um, and to a light way of putting something that's very serious. Um, and then we're also in the midst of another ugly surge of racial tensions across our nation. And then I guess the third ingredient would be we're, we're, brought, we're, we're caught up in perhaps one of the most important election points in our lifetime um, is going on. So how are you doing? I'm doing a check-in. Uh, Chelsea, please start us off. You, you show up first on my screen. <laughs> um, well, I, so when I, when I was thinking about this question earlier, I think, you know, it changes day to day, but um, I, as an artist, I'm a, I'm a very, I'm a feelings artist, like very feelings oriented, right? My work is, um, is pretty abstract and it is very expressionistic. And so, you know, I feel things very deeply. I also, uh, care a lot about the things that I care about, right? Um, to a point of maybe taking it a little, taking things a little too seriously, some people might say. So in this time, when there are things that, um, that are pressing on the internal world and pressing on the mind and pressing on the physical, like it's, it's I, I, I take all of it in, right? It's really, uh, there's many, many days where it's hard to just kind of, you know, go with the flow and take it easy. And I know that's the case for a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, it's been really inspiring because it has made me think deeply about things that I normally just skim the surface on. Um, specifically in the beginning of the pandemic, working in homelessness, that completely consumed my world, thinking about all of the individuals that you know, we love and care for and how they were being affected by the pandemic. And um, so I'll say, you know, it, it, like I said, it's gone in waves, but today I'm learning so much more how to still care and feel very deeply, but not be overwhelmed by those things, but start to critically think about what does it look like to take action? What does it look like to take all of those things that I've been feeling and reflecting on um, and taking more seriously than usual and saying, well, now what? Um, so I would say today, in this moment, I feel very hopeful um, mm -hmm. and inspired, but ask me in a week and I might go back to, you know, being exhausted and wanting to give up, but <laughs> so today I'm good, yeah. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Well, I, I have a follow-up to that. Um, um, and, and it comes out of what you just said to me. And so what are you doing for yourself? And mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of what kind of things you do in terms of self care? You know, the biggest thing is I just moved into my own apartment where I have a whole room that's a studio. So now the biggest piece of self care is um, is painting and being in a space where I get to create things and not even care if it looks good, if it means anything, if it makes any sense. I'm just making and letting all of that 
come out into something that may or may not be beautiful, but I don't really care. It just feels good. So <laughs> no, that's, that's excellent. Um, that, that word, you just gave another word that's encouraging somebody out there that's grappling with some of the same things that you're grappling with and doing perhaps a lot of the same work that you do. And to hear what you're doing, uh, again, this is what this medium is about. This is what this is about is how do we, how do we help each other? Um, and, and not only through this moment, but how do we continue to enlarge our tents? So thank you so much, Chelsea, for sharing. Jeremy, how are you doing, man? Please share. Um, like Chelsea, it, it fluctuates uh, from day to day. Um, the organization that I lead primarily works in public schools all over New York. And so when the pandemic uh, hit our city um, last spring and ultimately the school shut down, uh, it, it profoundly impacted our day-to-day -day programming. Um, but more than that, it profoundly impacted the people that we're in community with, right? On our core team of artists, um, collectively, they lost 11 loved ones, uh, mm. members and close friends. One in particular lost five uh, in his family. Um, the schools that we serve are disproportionately in the neighborhoods uh, that were hardest hit by the pandemic in New York. And so within each of those schools, uh, the families, the staffs, the, the neighbors um, were suffering. There was one week in, in April where over the course of seven days, I had at least one friend who lost one or both parents okay. every day for seven days. Um, and so you know, there, there's an intensity to that kind of moment um, that you don't necessarily feel in the moment, right? There, the impact of the loss, um, the suffering, there's a, a trauma that takes place that sometimes it takes a while to fully process. And frankly, I don't know if I have fully processed all of that. Um, at the same time that that's true, it is also true that in that moment of desperation, we see the best in humanity, right? We see the, the efforts to stay connected despite social distancing. We saw this creativity arise among our students, among our teaching artists, the, the schools that we serve, the larger artist community that supports us, um, where people not only were finding creative ways to connect, but creative ways to co-create beauty together. So whether that was done digitally or on social media um, or in virtual classrooms, uh, we saw artists from around the world contributing the best that they had um, and the power of art as a healing mechanism, you know, played itself out um, directly in our city during the pandemic and continues to um, play itself out through the time of social unrest, you know, that we've experienced throughout the summer and now into the selection cycle. And so um, it's definitely a mixed bag, uh, but it's in that, you know, that darkness. I think the first truth of scripture gets tangibly felt, right? The first truth of scripture is not that God is savior, Lord, love, or justice. The first truth is he's creator. In the beginning God created, the very next statement gives the context of his creation, which is darkness, emptiness, void. But in that broken place, the spirit hovers, and it's from that place of brokenness that he creates something beautiful. And so I feel like we've, we've lived that these last six or nine months, however long it's been now, it still feels like a blur. Um, in, in an accelerated and magnified way um, that I'm grateful for. I mean, the, it doesn't diminish the, the trauma, um, but it, it, it shows the profound resilience of humanity to get through trauma. One of the way, I'm sorry, but just to add one thing, the I'm image sorry. behind me um, is an image that was created by a group of our students right as the quarantine was beginning in New York. Uh, and it launched a campaign called Kindness Beats the Virus, right? Kindness is the it's synonymous with grace in the Old Testament in Hebrew, but it, it, the nuance is it's tangible grace, right? It's grace that is experienced, grace that is touched. And in, in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of a pandemic, 
there's no better way to demonstrate the presence of God than through an act of kindness that transcends the pain, transcends the suffering, helps people to heal through that suffering. And it was pretty amazing to see our students conceptualize this and then launch a campaign that, that spread around the world. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, um, Brother Jeremy. Uh, again, just for rich words and um, uh, our hearts go out um, to all those people in terms of loss. Um, but also just as you said, just going through the process and you're, you're so deep in it, it's kind of hard to find out where, where does that process come in, in terms of getting yourself back on track. And, um, and I, think it, I think it took us all for a serious blow. And I think all of us are kind of walking with, uh, with stilts under our legs and we don't, we don't know exactly where to step and it's hard to keep our balance. Mm -hmm. um, but I thank you for your strength. I thank you for your vision. Um, and I'm also just thankful just hearing just that, just that seed of the word that you just planted in our hearts, you know, going right directly to the scripture. And that's where we, I think we need to continue to go. We got to keep going to that well. So thank you. Uh, Sister Eva, how are you doing? Well, um, I think similar to Jeremy and Chelsea, it's definitely a mixed bag. Mixed bag is probably the best word to describe it. It's like every morning, you know, you wake up, you reach into the mixed bag of emotions and you see what you pull out for the day. Um, so yeah, I think same as everyone, when the lockdown started in, in New York in mid-March, we closed our building. We had to very quickly figure out what to do. And we had, you know, this spring and the fall are usually the busiest times for us in terms of people using the building, different clients, renting space, different groups meeting. And so we had to very quickly um, shut down and not know how long we were gonna be shut down for. Initially, we naively thought, oh, we'll be back, you know, probably by April or May. Um, and then each week just fielding, you know, a lot of questions about people's events and spaces that they've booked for different things. Um, in the midst of that, also working with the church to pivot to virtual events and what that looks like. Um, personally, I think I've been actually grateful in the sense that I know there's a lot that I personally have to be grateful for, um, and, um, and, 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 and being grateful for health, being grateful for family, you know, being well, there's a lot of things, but that was also intention with just the darkness and the heaviness that surrounded us communally. Um, so seeing, you know, having friends who lost loved ones to COVID, um, seeing communities that were disproportionately hit, um, that suffered more than other communities. Um, and just, you know, kind of trying to juggle the external heaviness of everything, um, while at the same time trying to maintain internal peace. That's sort of how I would best describe the, the last few months. Um, I'm also by nature a doer. And so my instant reaction is, what can we do? What can I do? What can we do to fix this? What can we do to solve this? You know, and so, so I've also had to sort of taper that a bit with, well, it's actually not good to always be doing things either. There's a lot of need out there. There's a lot of things we can do, but what does God want me to do? And what is the wise thing to do? Um, so I think actually a, a big thing I've been learning is just how do you be still and how do you be centered when there's so much going on and there's so much need and you could try to respond to everything and do everything, but what does it mean to be rooted and centered and still and let God lead you to do the things that need to be done? To, and you're not going to be able to meet every need. I'm not going to be able to meet every need. You know, even Jesus walked away from the crowds. But what does that look like for me is something that I've been, you know, struggling with. Um, and I would say in general, there's a sense of, I wouldn't say anxiety. I feel like it's more anticipation. It feels like there are things happening. There are things coming. We know God is still in our midst and he's doing something. I just would like to know what. So it's that sense of anticipation, but not anxiety. I'm not worried that he doesn't have it. He's got it, but I just would like to know what's going on. <laughs> so that probably summarizes how I'm doing. <laughs> oh, that's, that's really rich. Uh, I, love, I love the way you ended that. <laughs> that's, that's very good, very good. And, and, um, as, and I, I use the lingo, I feel you. 
<laughs> Indeed. Well, I, I got I got a question I'm gonna throw on the table. Um, um, of course, something to think about. It's a big question. Uh, so, in the midst of the pandemic, coupled with the ex expansive amount of infections and deaths, hundreds and thousands of jobs have been lost or furloughed. You know, for example, in our African American community, I'm just giving you one example, um, has seen a loss of over 45 percent of their businesses. Mm -hmm. That's just one community. That's almost 50% of the businesses gone due to this COVID. The statistic highlights and exacerbates an already massive gap in terms of wealth disparities in our nation. And so what, what effect of these disparities are you recognizing in your community? And I guess ultimately is what can we do collectively to be that neighbor that Christ calls us to be. Yeah. And there, there is no, I'm not gonna point anyone out to answer the question. <laughs> um, if I may jump in right away. Um, so that passage you started us off with, uh, one of the things about that passage that has always kind of, it, it always hits me where it hurts, right? The answer to the question is not the bloodied mass of human flesh by the side of the road, right? The, the question, who is my neighbor? The answer was not the victim of a violent street crime, mm -hmm. right? The answer to the question was the Samaritan, the one who had mercy, mm -hmm. which for the Jewish lawyer was, right, was, was scandalous. Um, because that Samaritan, not only was he the answer to the question, but in responding, Jesus said, do likewise. So he became the standard bearer for how to love, right? And the reason it's scandalous is because the, of a race issue. The Samaritan was the biracial offspring of Assyrian soldiers who conquered Samaria, raped the women and children, took the men as slaves, Right. And when the men returned from exile, they found these grown ups living in their houses who were the offspring of rape and injustice. Those are the Samaritans. And and they carried in a very, you know, explicit way, the marker of of, of injustice that transcended the biracial nature of their, you know, ethnicity because of how that that combination came to be right for the lawyer that was the standard not only of who to love but how to love right and the challenge to the the lawyer was you have to love the samaritan jews hated samaritans they resented their very existence they they ostracized them they kept them in marginalized communities there was no love between Jews and Samaritans. But then to say, not only are you to love them, but the way to love them is the way the Samaritan loved. And the way the Samaritan loved was not only to see the need, but out of his own, whatever he had to bear, right? He prepays the guy's medical expenses. He clothes him, he bandages his wounds. He comes and nurses him in the you know in the hotel right he prepays the medical expenses he says i'm going to come back if there's any overage i'll take care of the debt he's covering all of these layers of injustice that this man has suffered and that's the standard of how to love your neighbor i think in a situation like this we see people in communities that are suffering everybody needs to answer the question what do i have that can be responsive to the need that this community is suffering? And to what extent am I willing to love like that Samaritan? Am I willing to be inconvenienced, right? The man was on a business trip. He stopped his business trip to respond to the need. He came out of pocket. I mean, you just think about the magnitude of that. That's the standard. And if we're not willing to do that, then, then there's a gap, there's a disconnect because that's the standard he requires us to emulate if we want to experience eternal life. 
That was the, the set, set up question, the softball evangelical question. It's not receive, recite this prayer, you know, attend the discipleship class and go to church and pay your tithes, right? It's love like that guy. And if you're not willing to do it, then Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Man of Privilege, Mr. Man of Stature and Status, you just might miss out on eternal life. Mm. It's a pretty high bar, but it's the one that Jesus establishes for all of us. Mm. Indeed, indeed. Go for it. I, I really appreciate that, Jeremy. And when I was thinking about this question, there were like two different two different approaches that I, I maybe wanted to take. And you know, one, one thing early on pandemic that was happening. Oh no. You froze, Chelsea. It's a cliffhanger. Oh no. <laughs> they for shelter. Um, we're all. Oh, oh. Am I? You're back. Am I You're back. You're back. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Um, please, please restate what you were trying to say because okay. we didn't hear you for like about thirty seconds. Okay. So, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the the thing that stood out to me the most about how this was affecting the homeless population was that um, all the places that, uh, especially the, the street homeless population, um, all the places that people would go for shelter, whether it was during the day or in the evening, um, all those places were closed, right? When we had lockdown. And so there were many, many more people visibly on the street. And I uh, remember hearing lots of voices saying, you know, why are there more homeless people now? I'm scared to go outside because there are homeless people all over the street. You know, we, we heard in New York City um, many stories of what was going on in the trains because that was one of the only places that the street homeless population was sheltering, was on the trains. Um, and, you know, I, I even heard some people, you know, talking about how they, they were afraid to walk the streets, right? Because there were so many people on the streets now and there were so many more homeless people. And I said, well, I don't think there are more people on the streets it's just that everywhere they used to go for safety and cover is now shut down right um there's not even a place to go to the bathroom so you know what you're seeing is you know people's full vulnerable vulnerability on display um and that question that you're saying jeremy about then what does it mean what does it mean to be a neighbor in that moment right where there's somebody so that's kind of like both things are somebody and it's somebody that you usually want to stay far, far away from, right? Um, it's extremely inconveniencing. Um, there's probably a lot of fear there, right? There's a lot of uh, confusion and not knowing, you know, not feeling equipped um, to be a good neighbor, not knowing how to be a good neighbor in that moment. Um, and I, that was something that I heard very the normal way of being able to care for those on the streets. Um, a lot of programs were shut down. A lot of love in your care, your finances. Um, so, not, so now it's up to you to do the direct direct uh, people who were asked um and so i i jeremy you were talking about yourself to reflect on well what does this mean for me right there's no prescription for it i feel like i just froze again you, you froze for a little yeah, bit you're coming mm -hmm. in and out because i'm not quite sure how much uh, how much further without freezing again, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. You hear us? Yes, you're back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've been you've been kind of um, fluctuating in and out and so forth. Eva, you wanna add into it or speak to it? Yeah, I was, I think, you know, Chelsea, to your point too, like I was thinking about how even working on the Upper West Side, there are folks that I've gotten to know just by seeing them every day on the streets, right? So there's this aspect of how do we, how well do we know our neighbors? How well do we know them without a pandemic? Um, what practices do we have in which we actually know people, you know, by name, by story? Um, and so that when 
something tragic hits, it's not like an out of the norm thing for us to extend to our neighbors or to see what they need help with. Like, what does that look like as a normal practice without a pandemic? Because I think under pressure, we don't, we wish we transform into better people, but I don't know if we do. Like, I think it actually, pressure actually brings out whatever is already there and whatever we've already been practicing. We don't automatically become superheroes in crises, you know? And so there's this question of this practice. Um, and I think just also along with that, that, you know, we are called to love our neighbors and to, I think of the passage in Leviticus about gleaning the fields. The Israelites are, when they glean the fields, they're supposed to always leave margin. And mm -hmm. so this idea of always leaving these margins, you know, in your life, always leaving margins of resources um, that you are, that you plan on giving to other people who need it. And so I think that in this time, we are actually called to more radical generosity and not less. That we are actually called to leave larger margins and to be more generous instead of operating out of a mind of scarcity. Because I think the tendency is, you know, the, the economy is bad, all this stuff. We, we want to tighten up everything and we want to, to hold on to everything. But I think that this is actually a call for us to widen the margins and to be more generous and to give um, because that's how it works in God's economy, you know? So even just like, even I think for us in our building, we obviously have bills to pay. We have, you know, financial realities, but at the same time we have space and people need space. So are there ways right now that we can be generous even with what we have um, and, and not be, not operate out of a mind of scarcity. Mm -hmm. that's, that's beautiful. I mean, I, there's a beautiful synergy. I think it was between all of your responses to that particular question. And, and I like the way in which y'all, again, we just, we stand rooted within scripturally what, what it calls upon us to do. And I love the fact that Jeremy, you, you brought us right back to that, that scripture where, where we got to keep going back to. And that is the blueprint. You know, of course, the whole Bible is, becomes our, is our blueprint, but that particular scripture is really telling us and sharing with us uh, on how to love and how to, how, how, to, how to love our neighbor. You know, it, it says it very clearly, and it, and it does put a serious challenge before us that, that we have to confront, you know, just as you're saying, like, uh, just as Chelsea, you were talking about just like the level of homelessness is not like it's grown. It's the fact that they, like you said, they don't have those spaces where they normally went that you didn't see it. And so therefore we, we, we in so many instances that is walking around being comfortable with the way things are. Meanwhile, there's a whole lot of people behind the scenes mm -hmm. who's doing all this work. Mm -hmm. And then when they can't do it, when they can't care for so-and-so's bedpan, then you're like, well, what's that smell, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and it's just really, it's just that kind of uh, kind of activity that's taking place. And I think that also when we talk about the racial issues and like, why does it stand out right now? Why, yeah. why is it so like, I've had people tell me like, oh, I, I realize now that the racial, I was like, this has been going on the whole time. <laughs> where, where have you been? You're like, what, what are you seeing? You know, but it is, it is because everything stopped that mm -hmm. this pandemic crosses the sea and that's I see God in that <laughs> that for for everybody to stop like no no stop this stop this all right everybody look look around yourselves check out your surroundings and see what you got going on and then yes is your response to go into that natural thing is oh things are tight and I gotta save my money I gotta I gotta hoard my food uh you know or do or do you go to this kind of radical generosity you know do you which one do you go to you know, or you try to find some place in between. Do you try to be lukewarm with it? You know, I'm mean, sitting right in here in the middle with that. You know, so anyway, it's just an interesting kind of um, um, interaction right there. So, so I, I guess I'm gonna follow up with with that. Is I mean, all of you on this panel, you know, on all of us, and I'll put myself into the mix. You know, we're really accomplished. We we got a lot of things that we're doing, a lot of places we've gone. We've we've impacted hundreds and thousands of people with the work that we are connected to, you know, and um, in that which we have dedicated our lives to doing. Um, so with that kind of sight and vision from the vantage points that we have, 
where are the blind spots? What are we not seeing? What are we not hearing? It's kind of like if you watch only one news program, you really get a skewed view. You know, I was talking to one of my coworkers and we we talking about all the stuff that we're looking at to try to, we're looking at Al Jazeera, we're looking at uh, NPR, we're looking at we, we're looking at Fox News, we're looking at CNN, we're looking at all this stuff, we're trying to get the information and trying to triangulate and find the truth in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I know that we live in a soundbite world that something only stays within the public eye for a certain amount of time and then all of a sudden it just goes out of the way. And meanwhile, that problem is still here. So help us, where are mm -hmm. the blind spots? What are we not seeing? Well, I can, I actually, I actually have a story. I have an anecdote um, that I think that this question sort of reminds me of. So when I, when I lived in um, Shanghai, um, there was one time where a group of us from this church group that I was part of, um, we decided that we were, we wanted to help our neighbors who lived in these sort of um, shanty like houses near the river. So we thought we would get bags of groceries and things, you know, because we wanted to help them. Um, so we brought all the stuff down there and we're knocking on doors and people were actually saying, no, thanks. We're good. You know, turn, turning us away. They didn't want any of the stuff that we had brought them. And I think it was this moment, which seems quite common sense, but we can't assume what people need. We can't assume what people want, you know? And I'm looking, if we're looking at someone and presuming what they need, even if we want to be kind and generous and we want to give them things that we think they need, if it's not really what they need, we're not really helping. So I feel like one of the blind spots that we can have is often out of a desire to help we don't really ask the right questions. We don't even ask what kind of help they need if they want help, you know? And so some of that kind of basic question asking and just really knowing what somebody needs um, instead of assuming what they need and wanting to, to provide for that need, I think is, is one aspect. Uh, another blind spot that I think um, I recognize is that you know, especially where, where I work on the Upper West Side, it's a very intellectual, very well-educated, politically, socially progressive neighborhood. Um, but I think being politically, socially progressive doesn't mean that we are, you know, free from racism, that we are free from elitism or anything like that. Like there's still these prejudices and preconceived notions and ways of thinking and, even if it's subconscious superiority, you know, that can happen. Um, and so I think sort of being able to see ourselves for who we are and recognizing that there are still flaws there. There are still things that we hold that may not be good, that may not be true, you know, and, and that, and I think one example is even in the neighborhood, um, which I think a lot of New Yorkers know about is there've been these these uh, pop-up homeless shelters and hotels. And there's been a lot of groups communities in the neighborhood that are, are fighting to get the men who've been moved from you know, other places into these pop-up pop, pop homeless shelters that they wanna get them out of the neighborhood. And that's, you know, this is a neighborhood that is politically, socially progressive. So just even these sort of things happening um, and these sort of reactions, I think just for us to take a step and realize that you know, what do we think? What do we really believe? How does that line up with how we act upon these things? And what's really sort of in our hearts behind these beliefs? If I could add to that um, and underscore the importance of listening, right? I think one, one of the biggest blind spots that has been magnified recently is the echo chamber that we all live in. Right, the fact that all the social media algorithms reinforce the messages that we're already predetermined, you know, predisposed to believing or wanting to hear. And so we have all of these people, right, an entire world full of them who are being fed the stuff we already believe, but it gets more and more extreme and myopic and, and singular. Right, which means that the tendency to presume what other people need is 
much easier because we've already figured it out, right? We figure it out by all this stuff that gets fed to us. Um, and so we end up talking past each other. We're not actually listening to what the other parties are saying because we know the arguments supposedly because we've heard the, but we've only heard it from our point of view. And so the, the inability to shut up long enough to listen, right? To be humble enough to ask rather than presume um, the courage to act based on what the people that you're serving are saying um, rather than what you thought they needed or you know any of that kind of stuff. I mean, there's so many layers to that um, that if we're not very intentionally and proactively humbling ourselves every single day so we can have the question and we can, you know, the conversation rather, and we, we have the courage to ask the questions and we have the humility to shut up and not presume the answers, right? Then we can move beyond the current impasse mm -hmm. that, you know, is so pronounced. Um, but until then, it just keeps ratcheting up. The rhetoric heats up further, right? The, uh, the, the tension escalates um, and people now are shouting past each other not just talking over one another. Mm -hmm. I, I find that so true. I mean, but, um, you know, I was on another Zoom meeting just early this week and a very similar kind of statement was put out there from one of the educators who was on the, on the panel. And, um, you know, so, so it's like, um, you know, how do we, you know, these some, things, some of the things that you just basically just said, I, I've heard in many churches across the United States. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and then, of course, some of the things you said, I'm not hearing enough from many of the churches across the United States. Um, but it's like there's this disconnect within the community, uh, this disconnect in being able to take that, take those words to heart. And so is it is it about the, hum the humbleness? Is it that humility that prepares you to receive that? Is that is that what we're in need of? Yeah. I would add to that, too, like. I, I've been really, and I've been sort of trying to understand this for myself as well. Um, what do I get defensive about, you know, and why? Why do I get defensive about certain things? So I think mm -hmm. even kind of peeling that, I think to what, and I like that, Jeremy, humble enough to shut up. <laughs> I think I'm going to write that down somewhere and like look at it every day but what are the things that I get so defensive about and why I feel like they're pointing to something why why do I get riled up why do I have to be right why do I have to be right you know why does my stance have to be the right one why do I need to win whatever argument what's what what do I win what is what's in it for me so I feel like some of that those questions too of why we get so defensive Mm -hmm. No. Can you guys hear me? Crap. I, now you're in and out. You're in and out a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Looks like you're back now. Okay. I was going to say I could sign off and sign back on. I don't know what's going on. Um, so you know, something that uh, I've been thinking about, uh, yeah, I, th I think you're right, Jeremy. I might need to reboot, but am I okay right now? You're okay right now. Keep going now. Um, so to kind of even bring it like a, a level higher, like, you know, speaking directly to the church, I think that, you know, you look, you see what you're looking for, right? And so if we're, whatever we're looking towards or looking for, you be for meeting lets and things like that right um and i'm increasingly convinced that as we chelsea just looking for the middle grip. chelsea oh. okay i'm fine <laughs> i said yeah you're, you're you're breaking up a whole lot it's hard to hear you so yeah um try to uh yeah try to sign off and just get right back on we're just continuing on yeah. Awesome. We definitely want to hear what she has to say. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, it's like we got to read between the beats. <laughs> <laughs> but Jeremy, I think you were about to say something. Yeah, um, I just I wanted to come back to your your question there. I think mm -hmm. at some point, right, the conversation has to turn to action, and. In my experience building coalitions and working collaboratively in community with other people, the, the, the action that most often is the linchpin is the moment we're willing to surrender some authority and power, mm -hmm. right? So it, when we move beyond asking the question to then saying, okay, lead us, show us how that's done, help us understand what that means. Right, and then we're going to support that vision rather than overlay, you know, rather than interpret it in the way that we understand it and make our understanding the vision. I think it, until we get to that point, right, it's just talk and it's not really a conversation that is moving and transforming us. And, and there's, there's a difference between the talk and the transformation. So being willing to, to listen, have that humility, but then also the generosity to release some of the power, not to say, hey, I'm going to take my, my ball and go, right? But I'm going to bring my resources to bear in support of your vision. I'm going to make your vision my vision. You know, I think the, the passage of Naomi and Ruth is such a beautiful picture of this, where Naomi says to Ruth, I've got your back. And that old picture somebody referenced earlier right, of, of having margin as you harvest and leaving for the people that don't have, right? That whole picture, Naomi was a beneficiary of that margin because mm -hmm. on behalf of Ruth, her mother-in-law, who was, mm -hmm. you know, elderly and all that stuff. I think that's, that's really the picture um, when it moves beyond just the conversations. Beautifully, beautifully put. Uh, Chelsea, you want to try again? <laughs> Uh, look like you're frozen again. It's a nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, Steve, I don't know if this is a, there's a question that came up in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? It kind of ties I'm, into. I'm going to look for it. I think what. Um, Did it come up in the chat? It's in the Q&A. I can read it. Yeah, please read it. Um, I totally agree with the need to be humble and ask questions to better understand our neighbor's actual needs. How do we address the power dynamics that inevitably come into play when the privileged slash resourced ask those who are in need what they need? To put it another way, how do we ensure that the disempowered feel comfortable speaking truth about their needs to those who have power? That's good. Mm -hmm. That's a rich question. Mm -hmm. uh, I could again. Well, uh, I was first at all angels. Sure, had no at me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, right, maybe something. resetting her internet router. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're back for now. <laughs> it's okay. You guys talk. I will enjoy the conversation and I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, um, the, so that question, I think, kind of raises some of the themes that I just started to talk about. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the posture begins with humility, right? Mm -hmm. Philippians 2 paints the picture of how the creator, Jesus, took on the flesh and blood of his creation from a place of humility. Even unto death, he, really, he didn't think equality with God, something to be grasped. And held on to but he sets that aside becoming the creation and laying down his life right i think it starts with the posture right but then we have to make good on our words a big problem the church has had is we over promise and under deliver we're really good at hype 
you know, promising change that never comes, promising that if you attend this service, your life will never be the same. But on Monday, it's the same old routine, right? We do this on a regular basis. I think humility says, I'm going to change that posture. I'm not making any promises, but I'm willing to walk with you in a journey. And together, we're going to discover where this leads. I think that's how it begins to change. You change the dynamics when we step off of our place of privilege and we walk alongside the people that God is calling us to serve. That's what Jesus did when he, what, he stepped out of heaven and embodied a human form and entered into our space. He moved into our neighborhood, right? I think that's the way the dynamic changes. Until then, we're just another talking head making promises that may or may not come true. And from the vantage point of, the, of people who've been exploited, right, that's, it remains arm's length mm -hmm. because you've got a lot to prove. So it starts with the posture. It starts with asking different questions. It starts with listening and really probing the meaning and deferring. But then at some point, the, the actions need to match all that rhetoric or we just set up uh, you know, the, the, the partnership for another failure. Yeah. I love that. I, I agree with what you're saying, Jeremy. And I think that, um, you know, I think of Brian Stevens, Stevenson, the founder of EJI and what he says about getting proximate. So when you're talking about like posture and, um, you know, asking questions and then the actions that, that match up, I think that that's all part of it is also, I think in the church environment, a lot of times we create these structures where it's like, this group is volunteering to help that group. And so how do we more intentionally as the church create spaces where we're all coming in to serve in a certain way and it's not this group is helping that group necessarily, but we're all actually coming together to achieve something in common. Um, because I, I think that, I think volunteerism is great. I think there's a lot of benefits to that, but I think what happens is it sort of defines it a certain way instead of creating these opportunities to get proximate, to get relational, to really be in each other's lives in a way where it's not so much about asking these pointed questions all the time, but it's actually knowing each other. You know, if you know someone, if you know your family, if you know your friends, you don't always have to, I mean, you still have to ask, but you know a little bit more of what they want and what they need. So um, so I think this, yeah, so I'm also challenged by the idea of how do we as the church maybe start moving away from this idea of volunteering, but create spaces and community life in which we are really living life together. Um, and it's not so, uh, so separate. Chelsea, you're back. Yeah, this is my phone now, so. So it's good. Uh, we'll we'll try this for a little bit. Sorry about that. That's okay. Everyone just started streaming their Netflix, so <laughs> it's it's that time of night. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, I think, and Eva, I'm glad that you were mentioning that. You know, so my story was when I first started working at All Angels. Um, I really wanted feedback from those who were staying at our shelter, like what would actually make this better for you. I've never lived on the street, so I don't know the best way to create the space for you. Um, and so we had, you know, quite a few sessions, you know, talking about how our programs are run and how our space is oriented and, and what would serve people the most. Um, and one guy said, you know, Chelsea, I, I thank you for asking us this, but I feel like if I am honest with my answers, I'm not going to be allowed to come back. Um, and so that's why we, we usually don't speak up because, you know, like, again, I, I was holding the position of power at any point, I could say you're being uncooperative, you can't stay here, right? Or I could make rules up now that now exclude you, right? Um, I have that that position. And those who were staying at our shelter at the time, they knew that, right? Um, and so I think one of the things that uh, I have learned along the way is even allowing for leadership from within the community to not just be, a, you know, not just have someone who stays at the shelter who uh, has a leader's personality and can speak out, but actually what does it mean to create space um, at the, you know, the business table, so to speak, where 
there's a voice that has lived that experience. There's a voice who is from the community, who is being, who is speaking on behalf of the community, um, but has not just as like a token individual from time to time when you need input, but that you're actually there all the time and you're challenging our thinking all the time. And you, um, not just as a representative, but as a, as an individual who understands what it means to live in that space that people in my position are just conceptualizing or studying about or learning from my volunteerism or learning from other people who are like me, right? Um, I think that, you know, when I talk to other, you know, organizations who have that philosophy, we find though that it's a lot harder to do than we would like um, because that's a, that's a, you know, that's a, structural change that's a systemic change right and so we know that there's a lot of pushback in that but i think for those who are in the position to create space for indigenous leadership right so to speak or for um, inclusive leadership might be a better way of saying that um, i think that we should make that effort right mm -hmm. if you have the power and influence to recreate structures so that there is inclusive leadership um, we should prioritize that mm -hmm. Well, I mean, but even in the context of you speaking of just kind of leadership and that kind of guidance there, I mean, Jeremy was just basically saying it. We got too many people in these particular positions of power who are shut off to that conversation, who mm -hmm. are not stopping to listen and who are interested, who got a self-interest in terms of keeping and maintaining that which they already have and mm -hmm. not want to erode or to lose it. You know, yes. there's a lot of fear that's operating out there that we're dealing with as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one of the things is when I put that question out before us and I just kind of ran down this whole litany of stuff in terms of the economic disparities is that that's major. I mean, I think it falls into what you're basically saying, Chelsea, as you got a person that's in the shelter, they're in this position, they're in a really bad position. And they know if they speak up too much, too much out, whatever, they got to be very tenuous in terms of how they operate. I see that in academia where I'm working and operating mm -hmm. a lot so forth. So you got the untenured professor who feels like I can't really say too much about this institution because if I do, mm. they might do a system and get me out of here. You know, and these kind of, and that's just, I'm talking about from academia. I'm talking about this is in mm. all walks of life that you have this. And so we got these disparities in terms of this economic disparities in our nation. And that becomes one of those key kind of ingredients that's underlying a lot of this stuff that causes so many of these problems. When you got community at the community that have suffered through, you know, years, decades, you know, of, of, of systems that were literally made to stop them from being able to excel. Mm. And so therefore we got communities, black and brown communities that are terribly distrustful of all systems that don't care, that don't want, that don't, you know, don't trust government, don't trust police, don't trust churches, don't, I mean, there's a whole lot of yeah. distrust because underlying that's the man. That's the white man. Mm -hmm. That's you know, and there's a lot of fingers pointed in terms of the systems, and and so therefore a lot of people that may not be participating in those things, they get pointed at because they got that color, of that skin, and they are the recipients and the beneficiaries of these kind of things, these systems that are set in place. And so that's another big issue that I think that's going on. Yeah. You know, and and then of course, and then we as a church, we want to come and we want to we want to point to the scripture, and it, and it says so clearly before us, and we are preaching and teaching this word, but. It goes like, I think what Jeremy says, it goes from Sunday to Monday back to one's reality that they can't live that word because now I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna put food on my table, mm -hmm. you know? And so you got, so what you end up having is this terrible disruption within the whole ecosystem of our societal structure. And, and so it bears the question, I mean, just time right after one of our question is, is that, um, you know, we, we, we know that statistical, terminology when people say that Sunday mornings is the most segregated day of the week you know how do we break that down and I'm not just simply just that question but how do we break out those dichotomies out how do how do we attack those things what do we do you know I um I agree with what Eva was saying about knowing like with anticipation that something's happening right now but not really knowing what it is and wanting God to say this is what I'm doing right um, one thing that I've just really noticed with, with church being online right now is I've talked to so many people who have said, I'm not eager to go back to church the way it was. <laughs> and, um, 
you know, that's across denominations. It's, you know, different parishes, different cities. Um, and, you know, I think that's really saying something that there is an opportunity to come back to, to define church in a different way, right? Um, and one of the, the things that, you know, to answer the question about where, what are our blind spots or what are we not seeing? You know, I, I really have, I'm hard pressed to find that many of our brothers and sisters, myself included, right? Um, who are followers of, of Christ and led by the spirit to really see how the spirit is moving right now, right? What is the spirit of God doing in the church? Um, and how is the spirit like changing the way that we think of church um, in a kind of post-industrial and like an enlightenment, post-enlightenment kind of phase of like where we're always just thinking about things. We think about our faith a lot. I have so many conversations about my faith, but how often am I following in obedience the movement of the Holy Spirit? Do I even know what that means? Do I know how to do that? Have I practiced that as much as I have practiced talking about and intellectualizing my faith? Definitely not. Um, and so I, you know, I, I've sat around the table with many people talking about, even at our own church, what does it look like to integrate our two different, uniquely different worship services that happen on the same day that still reflect, you know, different demographics and different socioeconomic groupings and different, and we can't figure it out. <laughs> and I wonder well, if we can't even figure that out, how the heck are all these other churches going to figure it out together? Are we really pursuing the Holy Spirit's guidance in that and being obedient, even if it means that we're scared, even if it means that there's ser serious sacrifice that it's going to take, even if it means that it's going to disrupt everything that we're comfortable with, um, are we willing to be obedient to that directive from the mm -hmm. Spirit of God? Um, so I don't know if we can do it in the way that we currently think um, about our faith and in our church. Um, well, I'll just speak for myself. I know that I have to change in order to be able to make some, some steps. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, you know, I, I, I think that we've put so much uh, emphasis on Sundays on like the church is now, we often define it by the Sunday worship service. But when you look at the early church in Acts, it was a family. It was a countercultural revolutionary way to live. You know, it wasn't just about a few hours each week that they devoted to something. It, it was, it was about like a completely countercultural, like different lifestyle. Um, and so I wonder like, what does it look like Monday through Saturday? What if we paid more attention to the Monday through Saturday mm -hmm. and not so much those few hours each Sunday? What does that what does that church look like? Um, what do those relationships look like? What do those values look like? How do we use the resources we have? You know, if we were if if Sunday is truly the Sabbath day and Monday through or the way we observe it in the church as the Sabbath day, but Monday through Saturday is the is the heft of the church life. You know, yeah, what does that look like? Yeah. If, if I could just jump on or piggyback on what Eva just said. Um, <clears throat> one of my personal pet peeves has been the volume of churches that rent schools for service on Sundays, but neglect to serve the school Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Yep. We reduce the relationship to a transactional one mm -hmm. when the school is begging us to make it transformational, right? To, to come alongside, I mean, that's just one picture of what you're saying, Eva, but it plays itself out so many different ways in so many different spaces. Yeah. And the opportunities are dying on the vine, right? When Jesus talks about the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, it's not that the laborers don't exist. It's that the laborers aren't recognizing the opportunities that are presented you know, so he was praying that his disciples would see the opportunity before them when he made that statement, you know, and I think it, the prayer still resonates today. 
Mm -hmm. Imagine with us, Jeremy, what is what do some of those opportunities look like? Um, one of the, the easiest ones, right? When, when school budgets are reprioritized, they're never actually cut, they're just reprioritized. The most vulnerable programming in a school is usually the music and art programs. I have never been to a church of any denominational tradition, any ethnic you know, grouping that didn't have a music program, right? Every church has a music minister. Everyone. It is the easiest way to partner with the school that just lost sure. its music program. Expand the definition of music ministry so it's not contained yeah. in the liturgy, right? Get inside the building for six weeks, have a music workshop, have the kids perform in their school, and then take them on tour to your building, which is a theater, and they get to perform in the theater space for a larger community beyond just their parents, right? And now you've got a partnership that's a win-win partnership. There shouldn't be a school anywhere in this country that doesn't have a music program because every church has the capacity to be an answer to that prayer. And that's just one example, a million others. Exactly. Beautiful, beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Um, I, I think at this moment, I mean, just beautiful conversation, beautiful, beautiful. Um, so insightful and, um, and rich. I um, just love every minute of what we're sharing um, here. Um, I want to basically open the table up. Uh, if there are questions um, from the audience uh, that they have, they want to throw on the table with us. I know Eva pulled in one of them, but if there are any more out there that want to be filled at this moment, uh, want to transition to that time to be able to receive those. Mm. Do you see any more uh, questions, Eva? Not at the moment? No problem. Okay, so um, I, I think that Jeremy, you started a beautiful trend, you know, with that, with just that, that easy statement and seeing the very thing that is within every church across the board, which is the music ministry. Um, and, and it's the, the, the longest standing tradition of every church is, is song. Uh, and the, 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 the scripture made into, uh, into uh, the Psalms and so forth. And um, so uh, what, what are some other ideas that people have um, of that what we could do? Some of those other easy ideas that are like, as I say, are in our blind spot. Now, let's say, mm. what is that low hanging fruit right there in front of us, right there, that we mm. just need to just like uh, pluck that start by doing that? Mm. What is it? Well, it seems right now with the craziness with the pandemic and schools, um, mm. you know, it seems like families need a lot of help. So even mm -hmm. thinking through what are ways that we can if we have space, whatever resources we have, you know, I think the idea of whatever we have, we can bring it to the table. So mm -hmm. if I have, if we have a building, we have space and we know there are families in the neighborhoods that are really struggling with parents working, you know, kids who have to go remote for school, sharing a tiny apartment, whatever it is, is there a way that we can use our space to help alleviate some of that? You know, is there a way that, I, I, it just feels like families need a lot of support right now. And mm -hmm. what are ways that we can come around and support families, you know, in, in all these different needs? Um, yeah. That's one thing that's come to mind. The, the church that I attend is actually a, a Covenant Church of the Heights. It's in Washington Heights and it's a bilingual Spanish English church. And we actually do rent from a school, but the church has also been really intentional in, being in the life of the school. So there are members of the church who meet with parents at that school. There are families that the church works closely with to support their needs from that school um, uh, that are involved. You know, the, there, are, there are parents from the church who are involved in like different parent associations at that school. So just even, I think again, like not guessing what people need but really being in the life, really, really being in the mix with them. And, and through that, you know, understanding what those needs could be. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that um, really struck me when uh, when those uh, shelter hotels came to the Upper West Side, um, which Eva was speaking about earlier, there were 700 new shelter residents on the Upper West Side in like a four block radius, um, all within the course of a couple of weeks. And there was um, a lot of pushback. But, you know, the the people who were bearing a, a lot of the brunt of it were people who work in the shelter is social workers, it's the security guards, right? 
and getting a lot of that flack and something that um, uh, one of our teammates did was go to each of those shelters and just talk to the program directors and security guards and say, hey, we're a church down the street and we care about you. And we just want you to know that you have our support and you know, anything that you need, we're here for you. And they were like, nobody has, nobody has said that to us, right? Like the, the workers right now who are even in your neighborhood um, or, you know, the teachers and the schools, the, the frontline workers, the MTA drivers, right? Like the people who are exhausted and under-resourced and are already in thankless jobs. Like a lot of those jobs don't get a lot of thanks to begin with, um, let alone during a pandemic. And, um, and I think, you know, something that I would love to, to have our community do more of is, is just offering that uh, care and support to the people who are carrying a lot of the professional burden. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't feel equipped to do it, which we probably aren't, um, you know, what can we do to support those who are equipped to do it um, and who are putting themselves on the front line? I call I call that get up from our pregnant tables. That's what I call that. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's just overflowing with bounty and we got so much we already there. Um, uh, Brother Jeremy, I, I know that you, you spoke about, um, about artwork uh, that many of the youth that you're connected to that are doing. How is the artwork functioning within uh, your, your world and your realm and how, how is that how are you using that as a bomb and as a seed? Um, so we, uh, Thrive Collective, we create hope and opportunity through arts and mentoring in and around public schools. So bringing art back in the way that I just described with music is one example. Um, these background images are of our murals outputs, um, but those are examples of the transformative power of art, right? When you can take a space, a wall, for example, that's ugly and transform it into something that's beautiful. When you can take an uninviting entryway and suddenly make it overflowing with welcome, right? When, when, when those kind of things happen, an abstract idea like transformation becomes very tangible. Um, mm -hmm. For the students that drive that project, right, who have did who have come together as a group, who've worked through all their different points of view about whatever the theme is, their different ideas of how to communicate their ideas, and they've developed their shared vision, and then they've worked in community to produce something that none of them by themselves could produce on their own. That mm -hmm. transformation, that tangible change in the environment becomes an ongoing reminder of what's possible when communities actually do the hard work of figuring out where we agree and we build a community around that agreement, right? And so we see that play itself over and over and over again. Um, this particular wall uh, explores themes of identity and neighborliness. Right behind my shoulders is the phrase, I am. It's a statement, I am NYC, and it's a multicultural image. But I am is more than just a statement about identity. It is the only name that God calls himself in scripture, and it's the only name he shares with each one of us. It's a statement of Imago Dei, the image bearer that each one of us has been hardwired to, create, to reflect, happens to also be very creative. And so when we bring our back to schools that have been robbed of those experiences, right, the experience now reawakens the creative imagination of our kids. The, the, the creative imagination, which by the way, is essential to imagine a world that doesn't yet exist and make it so, right? It's those experiences, the creative experiences that awaken those capacities and the skills become transferable to every area of their life. And so that's how art plays into the work that we do. Um, you know, it, it's, it's meeting a specific felt need as recently as 2014 there were 419 schools in New York City that lacked a music or art teacher of any kind. They collectively served a quarter of a million kids and arguably the art capital of the world who went to an artless education every single day. So we have to eradicate artless education by bringing art back to those kids 
And in the process, we reconnect them to the creative Imago Dei that God hardwires them to reflect. Indeed. indeed. Wow. I mean, would you speak of that, that element of the creative and, and I, I heard the language of like bringing back. Mm -hmm. and, and so the suggestion of bringing back is, is the suggestion or is the fact that the artwork was there, the art, the art lesson, the art training was there, but it was removed out because of course it's the, the one, the arts are the ones that get hit up all the time. Right. Um, and I think, but ultimately uh, it's, the, it's the content that's shared within the institution that needs to be shifted because the imagination is there even with the art class and not with the art class. Right. It is the, it is the, it's the, the altered content that so many of you have received over the years, that's where I, 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 I'm feeling that there's a lot of our pressure needs to be put. Um, yeah. you know, and so much of how much has been erased from our books, yeah. you know, how much is erased from that knowledge, you know, like I just had a conversation with someone this week and we were just talking about, you know, what's happened with all these memorials all across the country. And so we got all these memorials going on, um, being taken down because they have this Confederate uh, foundational element with it and so forth. My friend basically said, you know, what? Most of these memorials weren't even made around the time of the person who went. It was like 50 and 60 years after the person went. It was some people that were coming along and keeping these things in alignment and building these memorials because they were edifices to their, to their wealth and, their, and all that they had and all that they garnered. And so it becomes those kind of signifiers. And then you got people on the outside who saying, well, I don't want to take it down because that's my heritage. And like the sculpture is your heritage. You know, that if that sculpture gets removed then something so majorly part of you is going to be disrupted that it's going to crush you. So it really begs to wonder like, is that the problem? You know, so that's why I go to this idea that it's the content that is not really being spent out there. And we got some, really some content less institutions that are just constantly rebaking and re-perpetuating themselves within the cycle and that's what we are being fed and so it's like we're like drones you know the same information being recycled and it's a misinformation and i know it to be so true because going on from elementary through high school and i get to college and i go to an hbcu for college it's like my whole life was a lie I'm like I, like what like a, a teacher tells me that Oh, reason why the noses and stuff that were knocked off of the statues in, um, in, in Egypt is because of wind erosion. And, and not that Napoleon's army came along and was shooting the dangle noses off because they Afrocentric features. You know, just little things like that. You know, this erasure of history, you know, are, are, the, are just to say, well, we ain't gonna say that one too loud. You know, we ain't gonna talk about Nat Turner too much because that will put into their mind that they can revolt and that they can fight back against us, you know. And so again, I'm going to that element of that distrust, mistrust, where many people in the black community would say, oh, they're using the Bible. That was just to placate us and to, 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 to calm us down. And they use that so that we wouldn't step up and fight against those masters and so forth. You know, that language, what I'm saying right there is what I'm saying is systemically is still very much alive. Mm -hmm. It's still what we're fighting against. And it's an inhibitor for us to try to create those kind of relationships that are authentic in terms of having someone be our neighbor. That's another hurdle I think we need to get past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. So anyway. You know, in terms of some of the stuff that was referenced earlier, like sh pair, uh, sharing power and, and releasing leadership to low leaders that's another space where the arts is so profound in every one of the neighborhoods that i've been talking about you walk out the school building and throw a rock you're going to hit an artist you're going to hit a dancer an actor a filmmaker a musician a vocalist a soloist in the local choir right mm -hmm. they're everywhere so the, yeah. the creative capacity to bring that's art back to that school exists within the you don't have to import it Right, you don't have to depend on some outside agent to Sorry. bring it back. It's Sorry. just Sorry. It's already there. <laughs> it's it's true. It already exists. And so, from a, back to what was said earlier, it's such a an easy starting point to power sharing, mm. and deference. You know, if you want your posture of humility to be authentic, mm. empower a local artist to do something creative with a group of kids. 
Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. That's, that's, that's nothing but truth you're saying. I hear you. <laughs> nothing but truth. Indeed. Indeed. There's a question that came through, Steve. I'm just going to throw it, it to you and please share. Um, I, I don't know about time or anything, but you can decide. Um, have any of you read Cast by Isabel Wilk Wilkerson? Thoughts on that book? I haven't read the book yet. It's on my list. Mm -mm. No, I have not read it yet, but I'm writing it down. It was recently recommended to me, but I also have not read it yet. So, so we now should, we all have homework. Yeah. Right. We all have to read it and then we'll come back and talk about it. Is it CAST spelled C-A-S-T or C-S-T-E? C-S-T-E. Oh, yep. okay, oh, I see. <laughs> I, I saw it just pop up. <laughs> Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, now I'm going to definitely read that. And I definitely, that, um, I had a conversation with someone a couple of weeks on the last um, Kitchen Table Talk that was brought up about caste and the caste system that of America and what it's based on um, and structurally um, as far as the infrastructure and why we have so many different problems um, across the ethnic lines um, has to go back to caste. And one of the things that the panel has brought up was this idea like, you know, you can have just just pure example. You can have like a LeBron James who has his rags to riches story and goes in, and moves into the top 5% or top 10% of wealth in the nation, but yet still is looked at through that caste system. Hierarchically, he has not been, he has not moved out of that caste system that he was born into. He's stuck there, you know, and, um, and he talks about that. You know, he, he's conscious of it. Um, I've, I've heard, you know, he's not using that exact language, but more or less, he's saying the exact same thing in, in, in content and talking about, um, you know, the way in which, you know, Black people are treated in, in America, you know, because he knows it, he knows it very well. He knows it means to be poor. He knows that it means to not have a stable home, uh, meaning that stable home as in you, you don't know if you're going to go home to the house uh, tonight because you, you, you've been evicted and you got to move to another place and that movement around. And so many of our kids are experiencing that. That's what we're seeing in our communities. You know, as a teacher, you know, being in the classroom so many years, working in middle school and high school and so forth, those little, un those unseen stories that are there, you know? And I, I think, and, and, and uh, but Jeremy really laid it back out to us. And that's why the scripture of this yeah. whole event of who is my neighbor becomes so important. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it goes, you got to go back to the fundamental foundational element mm -hmm. and we can't, we can't get caught up with the, the symptoms and so forth was going on. We still got to, you know, we can't ignore that. We can't ignore it and say that these things have happened because I think that that would do us a disservice, but we got to go to which is foundational and is really just rooted in love mm -hmm. um, of, of our, and true love of our neighbor. Mm -hmm. And, and then of course the scripture as Christ tells the story, tells us how. <laughs> you know, really clearly says how, how, how to love. And, um, and so, and then the question becomes to us, it really gets thrown back into our court. How, can we follow that, that doctrine? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And then on the other side, what is, what is our reward on the other side of that? You know, mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, by doing that, that whole idea is kind of like when I was in the classroom teaching and teaching art class, I was never one to like dangle the grade in front of the student. They say, okay, you do this, you, you know, you want to get an A, you want to get a B. Now, one thing I always created my classrooms around was about the knowledge and the love and the joy of learning. And then I would tell them the grades will fall in place. And I think that that's a concept that's very akin to that idea of who is my neighbor. It's like, it's that love and that care for your brother, your sister. It is by me defining you. I mean, I purposely called each person on this in this call as brother and sister purposely because in the speaking of it I'm, I'm acknowledging that you're more than just an acquaintance you're more than just a person that lives in new york or someplace else you we are connected you know whether i want to be or not i am connected i acknowledge it and i i'm your brother <laughs> you know and then that's that's the kind of the radical love i believe that we must display and we must push for, for before before us but in the midst of that, I think it also embodies what Jeremy said too about that idea of that listening and, mm -hmm. and shutting up and, and allowing ourselves to, to receive in that word and that message, you know, and, and, um, and, and Chelsea, you know, again, you were saying that just about, 
the way in which people tend to uh, look without seeing, you know, more or less. You said those kind of words as it relates to homelessness and uh, all the stuff around us and that they're missing so much because they're not looking with mm. the right heart, mm. you know, the right mindset, you know. And, um, and uh, Eva, you know, just, just all these words that you've just been saying, I've just been jotting down, jotting down different words from each person. And of course, we got like about 35 sermons off of this one call um, that could be, again, deposited within our community and that can continue to, continue to feed us. And, and the thing is, is that the sermons and the preaching, and, uh, and I think, again, I want to draw, draw one thing that was said by Eva, it was like, it focus too much on that Sunday. Mm-hmm. Or is this focus should be at Monday through Friday? <laughs> you know, is that the everyday church that we live in? And, and that answer is absolutely yes. Um, mm-hmm. Because we must, as scriptures say, we must die daily. You know, we gotta, we have to die daily to the self, to this flesh, and um, and then we have to continually keep ourselves in check uh, as we move forward. Okay, I don't know if we have any more other questions from the outside. If we, we, don't, we have a couple questions, but I want to do a time check. So, yeah. how many more questions would you like to do? Um, let's 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 go one more, and then I got our, our wrapping up question, which I kind of started a little bit, but okay. we're gonna. Uh, well, I started in a sense because I actually I talk about it from an imaginative standpoint. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask the question from an actual standpoint, meaning like, what are you doing right now? Yeah. But anyway, let's fill that question, please. Okay. This is a this is a big one. So okay. let's let's All end right. on a let's end on a big note. Um, <laughs> why do you think so many churches are still so hesitant to enter the conversation of race when we hold the truth about all human beings made in the all humans being made in the image of God in the example of Jesus treating people with love and respect. Hmm. I'll put that in the chat so we can all see it too. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a long did. question. It's a big question. Mm. Oof. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start it off and I'm only going to say just a few little words about it. Um, Cause of course there's something in, in reason I'm gonna jump into it because I, I think it's, it's something I think about a lot, but um, uh, I, I think ultimately it's a, um, it's a fear. And, um, and then I'm gonna use some words from a friend of mine. Um, it's, it's, and it sounds harsh, but it's, it's just the truth. Truth sometimes it hurts. Um, it's a laziness, um, a laziness in terms of doing the work uh, to find out. Um, because I, what I find out in a lot of work that I've done across the country and, and dealing with stuff is like people say all the time, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And yet I ask them, I'll raise an issue about some kind of thing and they'll give me breakdowns, information, stuff, study, because they put the work and the time and the things that they deem to be important. Mm-hmm. And if that thing is not like really affecting them, then they're not going to put the time in there for it. But if they take the time to do it, then they see how weary that work makes you yes Mm -hmm. and they see how much it hurts Mm -hmm. and it's hard to sustain Mm -hmm. to do that work it it takes a toll and history has told you every single person has done their work they they don't tend to live too long Mm -hmm. that's just just the reality of it all and those i mean they really do it and they're really in a position that can create change and that people are listening to and are following they don't live too long history has told us that so again that's that thing kind of like the person comes into the homeless shelter and don't want to speak too much to authority I think people get in the sense I think a lot of it has circulates around the fear and that's where I would start with I just read something today it was like one of our daily calendar things that you just tear off and I think was it maybe it was I forget who it was who said it um but they said, if you want to make en- enemies, try and create change. <laughs> and I took a screenshot of that and sent it to someone uh, because, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about this a, a lot, even within our own context, um, within our own church. And, you know, we're, we're starting to have those conversations, but already um, it's been, we're just laying the foundation and it's a lot. It's a, it, like everything that you were saying, Steve, I'm like, yes. And um, 
it's a lot and it's a lot even just for the people who are already in the room. And one of the questions we're asking is, well, how does this outlive us, right? Um, because it's not necessarily, it's not, it, it has to start with the people in the room, but in order to create a real change, it has to go beyond the people in the room. And so then even thinking like, well, what does this mean then for us to really embed this into the DNA of the church, right? Um, so that, you know, New York City, especially, there's so much turnover. So you, you do this, if you're courageous enough and have the uh, stamina and the endurance enough to, to do that hard work, um, then what comes next, right? How do you pass that on? How do you, how do you embed this in the culture of, of the church? Um, and even for someone you know, like myself who is like all gung-ho for it, I'm already weary and I've, ba I've barely started the work. Um, just yesterday I was on a call and I was, I, I went in with trembling because I knew that this was gonna expose a lot of my own crap. Like, and I'm gonna have to be put out there for everybody to see it first. <laughs> um, and I really don't wanna do that, right? And it's not even that much that I would be losing other than my pride. And that's still scary. <laughs> and yeah. I still have to, to say, is it, is it worth it? And yes, it is, but it'd be a hell of a lot easier not to do it. Mm -hmm. and my reputation would st still be what it is. Um, you know, we, we could still going, we could still go on being, being good, but would we be able to be, you know, right in the way of like, you know, would we be, would be, would we be right? Um, and, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think so, but so yes to everything that you were saying, Steve, um, it's, it's not, easy and it's very self-sacrificing mm. yeah I would yeah I would jump on that too and we don't like to do hard things we don't we don't like to do hard things you know churches I I feel like church has become a place of positivity you know we want it to be a a happy experience we want it we've sort of I think we've sort of substituted the joy of the Lord for positivity and, mm. and I don't think joy always means being positive but we want to feel the positivity. We want to be happy when we go in and happy when we go out. And so the, this sort of, these sort of conversations about race, hearing people's stories, entering into somebody's pain with them, that is hard and it's not fun. It's also really, really messy. And I, and I think that as churches, we often don't always want to embrace the mess. We want things to be you know, produced nicely. We want things to be polished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but does, doesn't a church act just like uh, the person that goes in a homeless shelter reverse and that if I do this messy stuff then I'm gonna lose congregants and therefore I lose the tithes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it has this, you know, so many churches look at the church from just a pure yes. business, this, or it's, it's messing up my bottom dollar, yeah. you know? And, and you know, I think that becomes another big issue right there. Yep. You know? So that, that that makes it very hard for the church to do that work because they, they're thinking about that. Like, I don't know if I can make that new addition on the building if I don't teach, if I don't preach this good news to the people and, and teach this hope to them and think it's going, everything going to be all right if I don't tell them that. If I don't give them, like what Jeremy said, if I don't give them all this hope and then, not, you know, and, you know, I can, I can give them a promise that I never meet, but um, people like to hear the promise. <laughs> it, it feels good. Like, oh, yeah, Pastor said we're going to get this. Well, we didn't get it yet, but Pastor said we're going to get it today. <laughs> well, it didn't come. But the, tomorrow's, I know Pastor says it's coming. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. You know, <laughs> that's the reality of it all. And it just keeps saying it. It's like, all I got to do is just tell, just tell me everything's going to be all right. They, they'll, they'll follow. They'll believe it. You know? And mm -hmm. so then a lot of people leave the church because some right. people come to church and say, man, y'all ain't real. <laughs> This place ain't real. And that's what people say. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, I've worked with all walks of life people and they got all kinds of comments and commentary. They tell me the stories, how they went to different churches and how they left the church and what happened, what the pastor was doing and all the corruption that's embedded in there. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. You know, a lot of dirty laundry. And that's not to say that, you know, I'm not even gonna try to paint the picture that all the churches gotta be these perfect spaces because they're flawed, because they run by humans. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so all of us, you know, all of us have all fall short when it comes to in that regard, you know, so, um, but, but I think that a place that could be read as far as the church would be read. And I think it would be seen if people know that the people in leadership are authentic mm -hmm. and, and are also humble enough to say that they're wrong or humble mm -hmm. enough to say that, no, you're right. Humble enough to say that, no, I was led wrong. I did the wrong thing. And this is what we need to do because I heard from sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so challenged me on this. And I listened, I heard them what they said. And yes, I have been, that has been in my blind side. I have not been paying attention to that. Thank you, sister, for sharing that with me. <clears throat> open my eyes to that. Because I hadn't been paying attention to that particular thing that's going on in our community that's right in front of my face. No, I didn't really want to put the time into it because yeah, I was afraid. You know, nobody want to, Everybody doesn't want to put out the, all their vulnerability, just like you said. Yeah. And, I, and I agree with you. I'm not. I'm not putting you out. I'm saying everybody feels that, you know, because we do have a lot of pride built into us, and a lot of that pride comes from the concept of family. You know, mm -hmm. we are a proud family, and we this. You know, you get that doctrine from your little child, and they tell you who you are, and you know, no, you're supposed to stand up, and you're supposed to be, you know. And so we get all this stuff, and, and then all of a sudden we got something that can knock that, mm -hmm. <laughs> like. I don't know if I want to tell that, that little story about me because this is probably going to knock me down a few notches, you know? So we, we all got a bit of take it, you know? It's it's a lot to take. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I, I have to pivot because we're getting short. We, 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 um, we're over our time. And I want to make sure I engage a very important question. Um, I call it the second line question. It's one of hope. And it's not one for the afterlife. It is one for the life that we're living right now that we're all taking a part in. So I would love for each panel, each panelist to share something that they're doing right now uh, that they're working on that's new, that, that, that you just launched into, that you bring into being. Um, and it could be early stages, or it could be something like you just like started the last couple of months because of the pandemic, or it could be something over the past year um, that you started this evening already, um, or something that's in your heart as something you want to get started. And so that you speak it right here before all of us to give your extra charge to go ahead and start to bring that thing into being. And then even speak on what help you think you need and, or what help would you like to get and receive to do that work. And that, may, that help may be that you want, hey, y'all pray for me. And that's all you need. Um, but you may say, hey, I need some stakeholders that can do X, Y, Z. I need some teachers. I need X, Y, Z. And I would love to partner with people. This, mm -hmm. I want to get you. Please share with the audience. Um, Eva, start us off, please. Hmm. I'll put you out. <laughs> I, I said I wasn't going to do that, but I did. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> We're good. We're good. Um, is this more like a personal thing or like as part of our organization? Yeah answer it any way you feel. I, feel I, did, like not put, I did not put parameters. No parameters. Okay. No. So if it's personal, share it. If it's something organizationally, share it. I think the, the word that comes to mind is reimagine. So I think at work, we are reimagining what it looks like to have church, to have this building in this age, you know, to that the way that we've always done things, we don't always have to do it that way. What does it look like now? What does it look like a year, five years from now? So I think on that aspect, like work-wise with the organization, with the institution, we are reimagining a lot of things. For me personally, it's also been a word, uh, reimagine. I'm, I've been um, pursuing this, this idea of what does it look like to walk alongside people more as they are experiencing death of loved ones and loss. You know, the last few months, it's been, it's a heavy year of loss. A lot of people have lost loved ones. And so I've personally been venturing it out into a personal project of how to create more resources and tools um, to help people who have experienced loss and, and have to go through that process of planning a funeral or planning a memorial service. But for me, the key central theme is this idea of reimagining, reimagining what exists, reimagining how technology can be used, the resources we have that out of these challenges, there can be something new 
that's birth, that's different from how we've done things before, that it's actually maybe even a call to not go back to how things were before, um, but to move into new things that God is doing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in a nutshell for me. And, and I think, yeah, definitely prayer, prayer, I think okay. for, yes, you're, you're right. prayer, <laughs> prayer is always good. Absolutely. Well, we definitely will, will keep praying for you, Eva. Thank you so much. Uh, Brother Jeremy. Um, for us, we, for Thrive, I should say, uh, we too have been reimagining specifically what, what does art education look like during remote learning? Mm. Uh, how do we create collaboratively uh public art in a digital age right for a digital space what does public art look like in that in that universe um some of our expressions specifically around our music and media programs transitioned really seamlessly to remote learning because the inputs and outputs were all digital so it was easy to create digital or easier to do that with the public art project right at some point you have to stand in front of a wall and paint a mirror in order to paint a mural and if the buildings are locked you know you can't do that with permission um and so how do we transition a uh, public art um you know student collaboratively produced public art for digital spaces um it's been fun to see our artists and students tackle the question um, you know, and the pivot in the spring and now uh, with the chaos of this fall, you know, extending that pivot into another school year. Um, so that, that's very much the front line of where we're headed and, and uh, trying to embody that. I mean, there's been a lot of great creative energy and now we have to execute. And so we appreciate lots of prayer for that. I'm excited too, because I think to the extent we get this right, it opens the door to ultimately engage many more kids in many more spaces. Um, the spirit is not constrained by a building and neither should we. Um, mm -hmm. And so how, you know, how we, how we oper operationalize some of these ideas, I mean, it's all new, we're figuring it out as we go. And, uh, and there too could use a lot of prayer, but also use some hands, right? Doing this all online, there's anybody who knows people that specialize in, in uh, you know, the technology and, and simplifying things and streamlining platforms and making them more accessible. We could use all of that and a whole lot more. So stay in touch. Indeed. That's really beautiful. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, this is the Chelsea. Talk to her, please. I want one of my new things to be to, to, um, to help Jeremy. So, but that's not what I was going to say, but I'm like, yeah, I want to, I, I want to, I want to help. Um, I'm very bad at technology. Clearly you guys saw the evidence of that. So that's not how I will help you, but you know, we'll talk. Um, <laughs> there might be something else. Um, so I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I think, um, you know, one thing that has just really stood out to me since this pandemic is, you know, uh, to, to the question of like, why, why don't churches kind of address some of these issues already? You know, our church um, is a very uniquely diverse church. Um, and yet we still have a lot of growth areas, right? And one of the things that the pandemic, you know, revealed like it did for everybody is, is where the disparities were. Um, and so those were really highlighted um, within our own church body. And I realized that, you know, maybe the model that we were working under just wasn't, wasn't quite it, right? Um, because maybe it was kind of giving more of an illusion of, of that inclusivity and integration than it truly was. Because when it got tested, I think Eva said this earlier, somebody said, like, when you really get tested, that's where, like, the foundation is revealed, right? And so our foundation, I'm seeing, actually isn't as strong as... I thought it was, or that we might have thought it was, and so the new thing is um, is kind of rebuilding that, or um, you know, and and I think it does that does require a lot of that hard work um, of of talking about well, what, why are there, what are the gaps, and why are they there, um, and that will require a lot of 
education. It will require a lot of reflection. It will require a lot of listening, a lot of that humility, um, a lot of that reimagining. But that is a new project um, that you know I've, I've just initiated in the last few weeks, and am a little, you know, concerned that maybe I just I just initiated like a, a five year project, <laughs> you know. But um, but it's exciting. But I do think that you know, what, what uh, I could use is even resources, right? Or even other churches who are, who are ready to do that hard work and are doing it and saying, hey, let's do this together because we're the church. We're not, you know, different parishes should not stand alone. Um, so how do, we, how do we say, okay, what if any churches are out there or any churches that want to start this work of just saying, okay, where are we really... Um, what are our gaps in our in our understanding and our effort to really be loving uh, in in an inclusive way, in a way that rewrites that history? Um, look, and my my phone's about to die now. Um, mm. But uh, <laughs> rewriting that history um, so that it's a it's a it's a true history and not a skewed history, right? To rewrite our community so that it's a true community, not a skewed community. Um, so if if anybody is already doing that work, or if you um, are about to embark on that work, I'd love to talk with you and and be in that scary mess together, I guess. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll do a quick share on a few things that I'm working on. Um, <clears throat> uh, with uh, SIVA, Christians and Individual Arts that I mentioned uh, before, um, uh, that organization um, working with a few artists and we we're trying to develop a traveling exhibition to go along with our kitchen table talks. Mm -hmm. And so we have a series of artists across the country that we're inviting uh, to participate as artists that would uh, submit their works uh, to them and that it would travel around. And then one of the stipulations will be for this traveling exhibition that we're creating is that wherever the show shows up, that they will facilitate a kitchen table talk in their community. Um, so that's one of the things that we're working on, um, that I'm working on with that organization. And um, I, I would say one of the things I'm personally working on is a, um, is a traveling show called Nine. And it's a tribute to the Little Rock Nine. And um, my girlfriend, she is a, um, uh, she's a dancer and she has uh, created a, a dance piece that goes along with this uh, creation. And I created artistic pieces in terms of painted the costumes. Um, I created set designs and all these different things. And we're about to start the tour cycle and we'll go to three cities. So I don't know if it's any of the cities that you live in. One of them will be San Antonio. Uh, one of them will be um, uh, Denver. And the other one will be Richmond. That's where the first three cycles will land. And then that, that we call the creation cycle where it then will launch into a national tour. And so um, it's all focused on the Little Rock Nine. Um, but for me, visually, artistically, uh, what's undergirding it, it comes out of the book of Ephesians with, where Paul writes, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities in mm high -hmm. places. And yeah. he encourages believers, his followers, to put on the whole armor of God. And so that's a symbol that I've been utilizing my work for many years now, because I believe that that is what protects us. You know, when we are afraid and when we're feeling insecure, when we are feeling that um, our pride is being attacked or we're feeling low, um, we know that God is protecting us through it all. Mm -hmm. And he, God is that shield. You know, God is that breastplate. God is that helmet. God is shouting out be. And so we got to walk with that, that, that assuredness and that everything is going to be all right in that we are going to um, uh, have everything we need and everything we have that we need of has already been supplied to us and abundantly and that we have so much we can give in our time and our talents and in our gifts and in our inheritance, <laughs> we can give so much. So um, I just wanted to just say the closing words in terms of thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Eva. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you for all the people behind the scenes, um, that being Joel and Paul. Um, I'm so thankful for the conversation I had with Joel and Paul and Eva before we were, when we were conceiving this whole uh, panel and we're just talking about what we're going to do. 
And I remember receiving an email from Eva and letting me know who the panelists were going to be and just the thoughtfulness that went into selecting these people. And I'm so glad for that time and reflection that you did, the work that you did with the organization um, and, and being thoughtful to make sure we had a really nice balance of people on this panel mm -hmm. that can speak, but also not just speak, speak about the things and what they're doing, but also challenge first and foremost us on the panel, um, but challenge all of us that are listening and that dare to listen. So I'm so thankful uh, for all that I've learned this evening. Um, I, I could show you my book uh, as you've been talking. These are the notes I've been taking. And wow. I take on what you've been saying. Uh, wow. So you're going to see my head looking down like this. Don't think I'm like not paying attention to you. I'm, I'm taking down, I'm taking in what you're saying to me because I got to live by the words and the messages that, that's been fed and I got to go back out and do this work. And, um, and I'm so thankful that I have, that I, I, I um, Jeremy, to have met you and Chelsea to have met you now, um, to know about my long lost sister and brother. And um, <laughs> I'm so glad that we're connected again. <laughs> and, um, and Eva, we've already been on this journey together and so forth. And I'm so glad that it continues on. Um, and uh, our paths just keep on intersecting. Thank you for the opportunity for me to share my artwork with um, the Redeemer community. Um, I'm so thankful to be able to share and to talk a few weeks back and just share a little bit of the spirit that is embedded within the work. So with that being said, I want to make sure that we close with a prayer, um, um, a benediction, uh, so to speak, for it. And, um, and we will all say good night. And so the next time that we come to this table and, um, and we do this work together. So let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, thank you, oh God. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time of sharing. I thank you for softening our hearts and able to hear this word and hear the, the messages that has been espoused. Thank you for the many sermons that are now sitting on our tongues, ready to be delivered to our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for enriching us with the gifts that are already in the storehouse, that are standing right before us every time we walk out our door, every time we cast a stone, as Brother Jeremy said. Oh God, thank you for that which you have given us, this ability to be able to talk and to communicate and to mobilize your people. But Lord, I just pray that we continue to be able to be equipped strengthen us with that shield of righteousness that will equip us to go out into the fields to be able to do the work that is necessary to draw everyone to this table. Oh God, help us to see the history in its proper formation. Help us to see the everyday faith that you are told us to walk in and not just rest upon Sunday to be that day to be segregated. Help us to be in communion with each other, not only breaking bread, but help us to be in community to listen and to actively listen and to actively do in our communities. Oh God, I thank you. I pray blessing upon each idea that each panelist has put before you. Lord, consecrate those ideas, have them come into fruition, have all those who are to help them, have them step up to the plate and do that work have them gather and have those tents be enlarged and able to draw in others into that fold so that they're able to effectively do the work in the community. For I know, oh God, that art saves lives because you are the, our creator and in your image, we try our best to emulate. And so God, I thank you for these gifts and I thank you for this time. Uh, bless each and every one that's been listening to all the different spaces. We may not be able to hear your voices. We may not be able to see your faces. But, oh, God, you know who each and every person is and where they're at right now. When I say where they're at, I'm not speaking about a physical place. You know where each person is at. Meet them, oh, God. Meet us. Lord, we come to you humbly. Our hands are raised our heads are bowed. We are on our knees before you, O oh God. So thank you for this opportunity as we, pray, as we pray in your blessed name through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. 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 Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jeremy and Chelsea. And thanks, everyone. Thank you all. God bless you. you.